Salutations, everybody. It is Maddie here today, and welcome to Bethesda vs. EA, the sequel for some of you out there, because there was an original video that did not have the best audio. I tried to salvage it as best as I could to make it audible. I should have just re-recorded it, and so I do apologize to anyone who felt their time was wasted with that video. So now, let's get into the conversation, which is about how EA's showing their ability to adjust while Bethesda has not. Now, this video isn't designed to put EA in the spotlight and say, look, how good they are, but more so to say that if EA can adjust, then certainly Bethesda can. So we're going to go down a laundry list of topics that showcase EA's ability to listen to the consumer and change their perspective, something that Bethesda continuously refuses to do so. This all begins with Need for Speed Heat. Now, Need for Speed Heat has come out to some decent reviews. It has a 73 meta score as well as a 6.6 .6 user score. Nothing to go crazy about there. Now, if you do look at Need for Speed Payback, that was a meta score of 61 and a user score of 4.2, which, yeah, this game was not good. So, quite honestly, this is a step in the right direction for the Need for Speed franchise. Now, ultimately, what was most shocking about this game is that it released without microtransactions. None whatsoever, which is a rare occurrence for AAA games and an even more rare occurrence for a EA AAA game. Now this is good news for everybody, unless you're Polygon.com, who posted the headline, Need for Speed Heat has no microtransactions, and that might be a bad thing? Dude, what are you guys on over there? Seriously, how could this in any shape way or form be remotely bad. The article goes on to try and justify pretty much that the reasoning for the headline was that it's ultimately a good thing there aren't microtransactions, but it showcases that EA has no confidence in this brand whatsoever. But two things contradict that very argument. Number one, there is the EA Originals program, which has games like Unravel, as well as A Way Out, which were successful and did not have microtransactions underneath the EA banner. Number two is that if EA did not believe in this product and felt it would not make money, they would have jammed microtransactions in there to make up as much of the difference as possible. If anything, them not putting microtransactions in there contradicts your absolutely heinous argument that needs to be wiped off the face of the internet. But more importantly, the lacking of microtransactions here is so awesome to see from an EA game, but yet you'll look at Bethesda and you see them <laughs> putting microtransactions into Wolfenstein Youngblood, a series rebuilt on first person single player campaigns that were fun, content rich, replayable, enjoyable, now completely changed because of Bethesda's greed with the latest entry, another smear on the franchise. And all I'm saying is if EA can keep their grubby little hands off a racing game, something very, very easy to monetize with car parts, car decals, skins, what have you, then Bethesda certainly could keep their hands off the likes of Wolfenstein. Now you'll also know that Bethesda has an interesting stance on remasters, as did EA. Back in 2017, Peter Moore, who formerly worked at EA, said, do we have teams lying around that are doing nothing right now that can go and make remasters? No, we don't. Moore continued, we want to focus on the future and delivering new IP and new experiences. There's easy money to be made all over this industry, but the real focus should be on the player first and focused on delivering new IP and new experiences. And that's where our real focus is. Bethesda shares this vision still to this day, but a recent earnings call showcases that EA has rightfully so shifted their perspective on this very stance. EA promises exciting remasters of fan favorites. Now, naturally, we all know EA owns a ton of awesome franchises. They have Mass Effect, Dead Space, Dragon Age. They own the Star Wars license, so maybe they can reach back, bring back older Star Wars games like Republic Commando, bring back KOTOR, the list goes on. EA owns some seriously awesome IP, there's Skate still, which some people thought the trademark was abandoned, but that was actually false. So that series does live on. That could be another great collection. There are so many EA IP ripe for a remastering collection. And just like Peter Moore said himself in 2017, mind you, once again, he's not working at EA anymore, but it is like an easy way to make cash. And wouldn't you know, Bethesda owns some awesome older IP that could absolutely use a remaster. Games like Fallout 3, Oblivion, New Vegas. While they didn't develop it, 
I'm sure Obsidian would be okay with Bethesda republishing it. Morrowind, why wouldn't Bethesda want to go back and do a remaster of any of these? Yet again, if EA can shift their stance on this, certainly Bethesda can. And we're not asking for a remake, mind you. There is a difference that a lot of people don't understand. Remake means ground up, we're recreating the game. Remaster, touch it up, maybe a couple of new lighting effects, what have you, and ship the game. You don't gotta do much with it. In all fairness, this next point, Bethesda was in on this first, but still for conversation's sake, I would like to highlight it. EA and Valve have created a partnership. So now EA games will be available on Steam. This does start off with Jedi Fallen Order releasing this week. But what's exciting about this is EA's willingness to recognize that consumers just want choice. If they wanna go to Origin and engage in the EA Access program, pay five bucks a month, on top of all of this and get early access to the EA games, get unlimited access to all these different games dating back to the past. That's their decision. But to remove their game from another platform just hurts business. And in the terms of Jedi Fallen Order, which looks to be what I would consider a prestige piece, as in something that EA just wants to nail for the sake of good PR, even if it doesn't sell a lot, it will improve their company image. That's something they desperately need. And putting it on all platforms will certainly help it. Now, I imagine the game will sell just fine. It is Star Wars, but once again, more platforms, more consumer choice. This goes in the right direction outside of, we'll say, Take Two, who went more towards the Epic Game Store. There's also currently a bounce back in the making when you look at Star Wars Battlefront 2. Now, I know not everyone's high on Star Wars Battlefront 2. There was the awful, awful launch full of pay to win tactics by EA. But as it stands at this point in time, Star Wars Battlefront 2 is a completely different game in a much much different game. The game, honestly, that we always wanted. And that's the sad reality of this industry nowadays is sometimes we have to wait multiple years to get the game that we were truly promoted. But I digress. What EA and DICE showed is that they were capable of taking a product that was being destroyed by YouTubers. Remember, EA had the most downvoted comment during this whole debacle in Reddit history that made a world record book which was hilarious and probably didn't help their company image so battlefront 2 just ultimately did not do ea any favors but despite all of that aggression that they had to fight through all of that adversity they had to fight through Battlefront 2 is now a very good game. And quite honestly, I've always said from the start that underneath all the layers of crap was a good video game, but it's great to see that they've added more maps, more classes, more modes, more things to do in this game. It's honestly fantastic. And that's because EA and DICE willingly addressed head on a lot of the big issues with the game right away. It took some time, but they pretty much reworked the entire product and made it into a platform that is acceptable. Meanwhile, we have Fallout 76, which is in desperate, desperate need of reworking and needs to directly address issues that have been around since launch. The game still does not run that well. The game still poorly functions and every single patch introduces a new set of bugs. Bethesda needs to hit the reset button on this project or just overall nuke it. But what did they do in response? Something that I've beaten the horse to death over and over again on the channel, but I'll remind you, they announced Fallout First, a subscription program for the game. They wanted more money. Money. And all that shows me is between the launch of this game when it was in a completely broken state despite Bethesda Game Studios reputation and their forcing of a subscription program into this game is that Bethesda may be in a more desperate financial situation than a lot of us are aware of. I'm not saying they're strapped for cash or anything like that, but to continue to push their bottom lines and to continue making money as a company, because remember a lot of Bethesda published games like Dishonored 2, Prey, and so on did not make a lot of money, they probably need to allocate resources from somewhere else and they're gonna go ahead and ring bethesda game studios dry and that's just a sad reality of all this so ladies and gentlemen as you can see ea they're not the best company in the world they still have a lot of mess ups and they will still have many more mess ups i can guarantee you that but if they are able to adjust to the consumer make the positive changes the right changes and listen closely then by God, Bethesda should be able to. And I'm not saying that to invoke hope or make sure people are confident with Bethesda moving forward. I'm just saying that because still to this day, people crawl into my mentions, into my comments and tell me, Matt, you're so hard on Bethesda. Look at this. The worst company in the games industry is doing better than Bethesda. That's sad. That's a really, really sad situation. 
So that'll do it for me, folks. Once again, I do apologize for the original video with the poor audio. Part of the reason I tried to force it is because I didn't want to have my face included for it. I had a skit in the beginning for some of you who saw, and I also wanted to make sure that it was a little more interactive of a video. I didn't want it just to be straight gameplay and commentary again because I've been doing that a lot lately. So I thank you once more for those of you who do understand. It shouldn't happen again. I'm going to get the mic fixed and the camera fixed as soon as possible, and hopefully we'll be back to higher quality content. Anyway, let me know what you're thinking of this topic in the comments down below. Other than that, follow me on Twitter, follow me on Instagram. Those links are in the description down below, along with my Patreon. Do consider supporting that as it fuels all the content I create here. Stay sexy, stay active. I love you all. Peace.